All right, that was perfect. It's right at 10 o'clock. Right at 10 o'clock. Good job, man. Um, there we go. There we go. We do have two uh, quick announcements. Welcome to worship. Uh, let's go with Jane Settle. You first... Sunday the 12th. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Sunday the 13th. Sunday the 13th. That'll work. That'll work. Sunday 13th. Next door. Over on the left hand side by the nurse, there's a big thing that says F O T M. What does that stand for? Feeding. Feeding. Miss Mary Agnes, one more announcement. Okay, yes, I'm doing this for Lynn. Um, first, God bless this church. I know that's us. We had a wonderful evening last night. And if I asked this church to raise your hand if you helped, it would be everybody in here. <laughs> so, almost. I am just so thankful. We had so many people helping, so many great volunteers. And I hope you had fun, even if your back was hurting when you went home. A pound. Oh, one pound. Okay. I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't, one pound. But I think she's got them in Ziploc bags, right? No, I'm thinking they're gallon size Ziplocs, but maybe they're not. Quart size. Quart size. Okay. Neither here nor there. There. It'll yeah, be twelve dollars per bag. And if you would like to buy a full butt, we had um, two full butts left over, and they are going to be fifty dollars each, right? Yes. And yes. some of them were right out of the brunch at the bench <laughs> That's right. That's right. And um, as we are prepared to worship, I uh, thank you for the announcement. Uh, I don't want to forget this. I just received a text from Elise uh, Smith. Good morning, Mom. Miss Ann won't be there at church today. She's going to meet her first great-grandchild. So uh, Anna Elise Smith was born Thursday. Mom and baby are doing great. Just in case I forget to announce that for our prayer time, uh, we praise the Lord and rejoice with the Smith family. First great-grandchild. So, um, Well, let us worship our God and King. Let's please stand for our call to worship. Right there in your bulletin taken from 1 Chronicles 16. I'll, I'll state the regular together. Corporately, we'll recite the bold. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the people. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. 
tell of all His wondrous works. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord has made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and joy are in His place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. Let us pray. Father, we do ask Your presence, Lord. It is already here. You are already present. But we ask, Lord, Your presence in a particular way as we worship Your name. We pray it be pleasing in Your sight. Lord, there are many uh, joyful, dare I say, distractions that could inhabit our mind right now in this hour. But Lord, I pray, God, that you would, by your Spirit, enable us to worship you, to worship you in truth and in spirit. And so for all the responsibilities in the coming week and all the things this past week, I pray that you'd remove them, Lord, and enable us, as we've just read from your word, to sing to you, to tell of your salvation. Lord, enable us to ascribe to you glory and strength. Father, may we not forget the words that you yourself taught your disciples to pray when you taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let us do just that. Let us ascribe to the Lord glory, honor, and strength through song. 776, on this what many call the Reformation Sunday, a mighty fortress is our God. 776. Word of all earthly powers, 
His truth abideth still. Amen. Our public confession goes along with the theme of it being Reformation Sunday. It deals with good works. Uh, Good works do not have the power to save, although they do accompany true salvation. So, this is taken from our own confessional document, Westminster Larger. Can we merit pardon of sin through our good works? We cannot, by our best works, merit pardon for sin or eternal life at the hand of God. Nor can we satisfy for the debt of our former sins. But when we have done all we can, we have done but our duty and our unprofitable servants. And because they are good, they proceed from His Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. And this will transition to our prayer of confession and notably our verse of pardon. This is a famous passage, Romans 1, 16 and 17, from Martin Luther's life. Luther was charged to teach this, and at the time he was an uh, Augustinian monk who was headlong into the system of works equal salvation. But he came to this passage, and here it reads, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He was translating this. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. And here it is. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, that righteousness of God was always translated, your righteousness to him, what you have to gin up. What he realized is it's actually not a genitive, it's a dative, meaning that it proceeds from God as a gift. It is yours. It isn't something you have to gin up in yourself to say, here you go, here's my righteousness. No, it's something he bestows. And that was a life-changing thing for Luther, for the church. And I would much rather that be the case. Our righteousness does fall very short. So this is, a, this is good news that um, God gives us that which he requires, his righteousness by faith. So this is who we're going to this morning. Well, uh, our prayer is adapted from him, so I will say the regular print together corporately, we will pray the the bold. Awaken our hearts, O Lord, our God. Make them ever watchful to serve you and your purposes. Trouble us with the smallness of our own vision and work. Trouble us with the greatness of your command to make disciples of all nations. Trouble us with your great love for sinners and our own slowness to make you our greatest love. Trouble us with the brevity of our lives and time, talent, treasure, not invested in eternity. Comfort us by drawing us to yourself with the cords of your unfailing mercy. Comfort us, O Lord, with the assurance of our salvation and unending glory with you when we suffer and are afflicted. Rekindle in us a renewed desire for the coming of your glorious kingdom, when all wrongs will be made right, when everything that is broken will be made whole, and when we will trade a cross for a crown. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so it is, Father, we give you the next few moments of silent confession in your presence. Father, we thank you that we, as we just read in Romans 1, that gospel truth, that it is not our righteousness that saves us. Rather, it is righteousness of Christ that he earned, which you give to us into our account. Thank you, Lord, that we live in such a time that 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 is the reality and that, Lord, we understand that to be true. We we surely are still battling the old person the flesh, and that has come out in several ways. It, it has come out this past week in a refusal to trust in your providential care, a, a questioning of if you know what you're doing, and 
Lord, uh, that gets worked out itself in shortness with neighbor and those closest to us. We certainly have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. We certainly have not loved our neighbor with our, uh, as ourselves as, as well. But God, the good news is this. You take our sins and you throw them into the depths of the ocean. They're gone. And so, Lord, I pray that in this moment you enable us by your Spirit to walk free from condemnation, as your Word says in Romans 8. Free of condemnation. Lord, that we would be a people uh, who show off this freedom to an onlooking world. We're so desperate to know about it. And Lord, make us conduits of grace in that way, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And uh, just some housekeeping. I Take this as an apology. Uh, obviously, we're not having the Lord's Supper. It's the fifth Sunday, uh, and we would mess up the rotation, so there's no elements before you for that reason. It's first and third, and I totally forgot. And and. It being the fifth. So I ask your forgiveness on that one. But uh, we come now for the prayers of our people. And I want to remember there, let me make sure I have her name right. Anna Elise Smith, born Thursday. We praise the Lord with Miss Ann over her first great grand. So who else can we pray for here this morning? I see Linda. Certainly, Henry. Jane. I have two. Um, we have two members who some of you know and others who don't that have COVID. Um, Tanya and Miss Norma. And um, Miss Norma has a very bad case. And um, so we can just keep her in our prayers. And then mm. my other one just went out of my brain. Oh, I had a nice long conversation with Deb Jenkins yesterday. I did not think I had ever met him. As it turns out, he used to work with my ex-husband, and I have met him. <laughs> but he seems to be really more upbeat than it has sounded. He's home at his place on John's Island. He's had a rant made. He talked about different ways to get around. He said he did a prosthetic on and that kind of thing. And I think he's using you as a, an information resource. <coughs> that he feel blessed that he has to go. Good. Good. Glad to hear it. Can I see one more hand over here? Charlie. Okay. Jane, did I see? Wow. We'll do that. I saw one more. Oh, there we go. Ed. That's awesome. Good. I have one for a friend from St. John Kay Kitchen. She's 88 and she's been through so much in her life and has overcome and is one of the greatest Christians you could ever want to know. But unfortunately, she was sitting on a bench talking to Sandy B at some event and the bench gave way and she fell and she cracked her oh. kneecap. And so just pray for her. She will see lots of Jesus on Monday. Find out what they're gonna, what they can do for her. She's already recovered from a broken hip and hip replacement. She's oh. doing great, and they hope she comes mm. to the curveball. 
Mm. Certainly will. Carol? Scotty. Good, good. Certainly. Praise the Lord for that. Good, good. I know. <laughs> Lord, praise God for this person. And all your souls are the same. And just, the church is still closed. And I feel so lucky to be part of it. Amen. We're providentially blessed. <laughs> lucky, kind of. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> well, we're we're thankful to have you part of part of our church. Very thankful. Uh, well, says no more. Let's go before our Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful work. Um, much of it goes unseen, but Lord, this, this weekend we saw it in your people getting together for this uh, barbecue. But thank you for the fun that it is. Uh, to get together and put on something like that. We thank you that constantly we see you coming through when we don't know how it will. Uh, but you do, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for being part of, of that. We bring to you many, Lord. We Again, thank you for this great granddaughter um, that Miss Ann now is visiting. We thank you, Lord, for being with baby and mom, and thank you, God, that, that Miss Ann's um, got to see this. We thank you for that. We pray for Henry and this um, one in a series of heart surgeries this child will have, this baby. Lord, may your continued guidance be over the doctors as they figure out the best optics and route to go for this so delicate surgery. But we do bring to you, baby Henry. Lord, we thank you for Scotty and thank you for the work in his life. Lord, it's a, in many ways it's going to be uphill, but uphill with you. And so we pray, God, that this will be used in a mighty way to bring Scotty even closer to yourself. And thank you, Lord, that he is, uh, you've seen fit to bring him through another stint of this. Lord, we praise your name as Ken brought before us this son, this wayward son in this family he knows who actually was used mightily to bring the family back to you in a Romans 8 type of situation. We thank you for that. I pray, God, you give us all eyes to see the possibilities of that when all seems nearly hope and, uh, hopeless, but God, you, you are still at work. We pray for Ed's dad as he's coming out of rehab. Lord, enable him to, to get around as good as he can, and we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in his life. We thank you for seeing Ed and his faithfulness to his earthly father in such a way. We do pray for him that you would strengthen all that needs to be strengthened so that he is um, somewhat more independent, but yet at the same time... Um, we just pray, God, that you continue to just heal them. Lord, we pray for those in our own church who are battling COVID. We think of Connie and Norma, especially Norma. We pray, God, that you would bring them back to us fully recovered. And we pray for Norma and, and her lung usage and capacity right now and all the other things that go with this awful virus. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen her in this hour. For kitchens, God, this back kneecap, we pray, Lord, that you would give her endurance to see this all the way through. God, that you'd bless, bless her with um, just the ability to go on after having surgery and then doing this. But we pray for your healing hand on her. We thank you for Bev and the upbeatness we just heard about. We pray that would continue. Uh, Lord, we thank you for who they are, for so many people here in this community. But we, we do pray, Lord, in this new chapter um, uh, that, that you would, Lord, uh, enable there to be um, a freeness there. We pray for Albert and these medical procedures coming up. We pray your guidance upon him and the doctors as they care for Albert. And we do pray your strengthening hand on him even right now. We also think of the two Christies we've just heard about who will be undergoing surgery, one for foot and another one. But we do pray, God, that you would see to it that you bring them all the way to, to full recovery. And thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to pray to you about these things. God, we pray for our nation right now, and especially here in this polarized election 
uh, time we find ourselves in, we pray, Lord, that you would equip us as your people uh, to be a conduit of peace where there is great uh, fraction and friction and things of that nature. But Lord, we do pray, God, that, that the right people will be there who reflect your heart, who reflect your laws. Um, God, may justice roll down uh, according to your word. And uh, Lord, in all these things, we pray that it would be done in a safe way, Lord, that your grace would surround us. And so, God, as we're about to get into your word, we pray, Lord, for a miracle. We pray that you, Holy Spirit, would so speak to our hearts through your word. Enable us to be challenged where that needs to take place. Enable us to live out our faith. And Lord, increase our faith. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, let us continue to worship God through the act of giving, giving back to him that which is already his. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So let us now give back to God freely and joyfully. Let's please stand for our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Lord, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to give back to you, to worship you through our tithes and offerings and gifts. We pray that you'd use these, Lord, to mightily impact your kingdom wherever they are providentially needed. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you all. Please be seated. And I invite you to turn to Philemon uh, as we finish our second part of this letter, uh, letter to Philemon. Man, let me, if you're using an NIV Bible, it is... Actually, page 1,000. Um, that was a hard one to find by itself. It's just one chapter. So Philemon, and I will read our text this morning, starting in verse 8. Paul writes, Accordingly, though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in, in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Now, there's a pun there. We'll get to that. I am sending him back to you. Send him to heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment of, uh, for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own accord. 
For this perhaps is why he has parted from you for a while, and you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge it to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a great a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I'll be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Astroniscus, I messed that one up, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The flower fades, the grass withers, but the word of our God endures forever. Thanks be to God. Now, I'll tell you this. Our culture is filled with many cringe-worthy phrases, and here's the one that gets, gets me. It's this. Sorry, not sorry. What is sorry, not sorry? It, it is uh, no other phrase encapsulates an insincere apology. Uh, sort of like when you have two kids fighting and, and you say, all right, well, say you're sorry. And the one obviously just goes, sorry. Now, is that heartfelt? Is that going to lead to heart change? No. <laughs> they weaponized the word sorry. Conflict or potential conflict gives the flesh an opportunity to come out. Dare I say, if you want to picture human nature, our apologies need apologizing. That's how it goes. That's a good picture of human nature. Our apologies need apologizing. We're going to get into this this morning. Expert peace broker Paul. Relationships left alone will drift towards conflict. So if there's no talking between one another, if there's just time passed, I know we all have that rare friend where you could pick up five years later and everything's fine. I know that exists. But on the average, when there's no communication between two parties and one is wrong the other, it's not long before that other party or both are Hitler or worse than Hitler. Uh, the, the badness gets exaggerated. Can you believe what they did? They're a monster. It's a dehumanizing experience that happens. Paul will say, though, remember last time Philemon saw this, or uh, yeah, Philemon saw Onesimus. He had stolen. That's why he left. That's why he's a runaway slave. He stole some stuff from him and took off. Um, Paul will say this is a wonderful, actually, God-given opportunity for you to practice what you preach, Philemon. Philemon is the pastor of that area, Colossae. We can speak about it here Sunday morning. We can say we love our enemies, but wait until you have a real enemy. Wait until you actually have to practice it. It is my argument, my thesis. Book of Philemon presents relationships on the human plane. Um, here's what it comes down to. Your uh, I get this mixed up all the time. Your horizontal relationships between people is always a reflection of your vertical relationship with God. If you and God are not doing well, guess what's going to happen? Now, it doesn't mean every time there's a conflict, something's wrong with that, but it does mean, typically, our relationship with God is mirrored in how we relate to others. I have a thought exercise just to prove the point. I'll say a few words. These will bring about some emotional energy from everybody. Dabo Sweeney, Steve Spurrier, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, the economy, elections, pineapple on pizza. All these things are emotionally charged, <laughs> um, emotionally charged. It's been said that if any fool can start a conflict. It takes an emotional genius to broker peace. Being a peacemaker is way, way more difficult than you think. Way more difficult. In fact, the Beatles of the generation was a band called Oasis back in the early 1990s. Oasis were everybody's favorite. The two brothers in that band, they haven't talk, uh, spoken to each other in 12 years. And uh, they all say the same thing. I'll be good if I don't have to talk to that guy the rest of my life. People have offered millions of dollars for there to be a reunion tour, all this other stuff. Nope, not having it. You don't know that guy. And both of them are saying that. You don't. So here's the big picture of Philemon. 
a book title, the same, same title. Relationships, a mess worth making. That's Philemon. Your relationship with others is a reflection of your relationship with God. The two are connected. James would say, you can't say you love, you, you love God and hate your brother. You can't say, you, you know, somebody's lying there. Um, so this morning, we're going to look at this. Number one, there, there's three aspects to this text we just read. Number one, we're going to have a new perspective on forgiveness. Number two, there's a new identity. And number three, there's a new motivation for love. Let's look at the first one, new perspective on forgiveness. First few verses go like this. Accordingly, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, says Paul. I'm telling him to take him back. I'm, I could get an apostle card. I could do that and say, you, you do that because thus says the apostle Paul. Verse 9, for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, now a prisoner for Christ Jesus, I, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, and his name literally means useful, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Here Paul is saying, I can, again, I could pull the apostle card. There's not many of us around. I could say, you've got to take this guy back. That's not going to lead to heart change. I'm going to do it a little different. Verse 9 is especially important. He uses a word called parakaleo. It's Greek, and it means alongside of. It usually depicts the work of the Holy Spirit. Alongside of those who suffer. Someone who's right beside a sufferer. Beside the hurting. And here Paul is assuming, I'm right beside you as you suffer, because he's asking Philemon to absorb the debt. That's what forgiveness is. You're taking a hit. All life-changing, real forgiveness is absorbing a debt. Onesimus ran away because he stole from Philemon. Run away would cost 500, 500 denarii. And remember, this is not chattel slavery. This was an economic program for the poverty-stricken. It did not get God's blessing. We need to make that sure, but not as wicked as um, the colonies' version. Paul is saying, look, Philemon, I've lost all to follow Christ. I, I, I am now in chains. I've done some absorbing of loss right now. And I, I'm asking you to do the same. All real forgiveness is painful because it entails taking a hit and absorbing. Otherwise, it's not forgiveness. Just an example, my grandfather was as blue collar as you can come. He uh, uh, was a mechanic for York County. He fixed school buses there and um, saved up enough to buy um, his house in 1962 at the grand price of $5,000, which he complained about. And um, during a visit one Christmas, my 12-year-old brother and I were playing football. And uh, Pat, my brother, for some reason, decided not to go forward on fourth and punt. And that punt landed through his living room window, crashed right through it. And it's Christmas time, you know, you get, you get Christmas money. And so Pat, 12-year-old as he is, rips the Velcro of the wallet and is getting out his Christmas money. And Paul Paul says, no, don't do that. I forgive you. And that forgiveness meant Social Security check next month, probably go to care, uh, take care of that. He'll probably have to call a few cars, a few, few people. He did some freelance mechanical work and he's going to have to call them. I, I can fix it for you. He needs that extra cash. But Paul Paul absorbed the economic debt rather than see his grandson Oh, use all his Christmas money to pay for that window. That's, that's real forgiveness. You have to take a debt. Um, sorry, not sorry, is not forgiveness. Uh, it means that whatever wrong done against us, if we truly forgive that person, we don't tuck it away for a more convenient time. Some of us need dopamine hits for superiority. Remember what you did in 1988? We don't do that. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is burning that card and never bringing it out. So here's Paul's pitch. Philemon, absorb it. Absorb it and welcome him. I, I am acting as the Holy Spirit being right beside you in suffering. Look at me. And here's a few ac application points before moving. Um, here's, here's a quote from, I love this, from Tim Keller. Forgiveness flounders 
because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans and I exclude myself from the community of sinners. So forgiveness really happens when I see the other person as this monster who's not even human and I'm above them. I'm not like them. So that's the, the seedbed where forgiveness re, uh, unforgiveness really grows. Um, number one, so here's just applying this. Have you paid for all the footballs that have crashed through your windows? I mean that metaphorically. Have you burnt the receipt of all others owed to you? And I'll just say, you will not grow in Christ's likeness. You will become more hard-hearted and bitter until you do this. You've got to burn the receipt. You've got to pay for the footballs. Number two, have you reached a point in your sanctification where we don't dehumanize those who, those who have wronged us? And at the same time, not deified ourselves against those who've wronged us. That's the typical dance we do. Dehumanize those who've wronged us and deified ourselves. This one would have been easy for Philemon. Some, you know, poor, he's in a different economic group. He's, he's, he, you know, he stole from me. How easy it had been for him to stand above him and go, I'd never do that. I'm so much superior. Well, Paul is blowing that up right now. Paul says, no. Forgiveness means you absorb the debt. You pay for it. It's going to be painful. But uh, why? And here's number, number two, new identity. Coming to Christ frees us from all the pseudo-identities we strive for. It grants us what our hearts crave, and that is an, a stable identity. The world's oldest lie had to do with identity. Satan comes to Eve and says, you can identify as God. You can be like God. You can identify as the deity. The first sin, the sin to be like God, now means that you have to base your identity on something other than God, and eventually you'll have to serve it. It will be your master. This means whatever we base our value and identity on will eventually become deified. We'll have an altar. What does that mean today? This is weird. Tell, uh, you can't say I'm lying here. Today, we're in a consumerist culture, and you are the car you drive. You are the clothes you wear. You make a public declaration of who you are based on the branding. We project a desired image based on what we own. It's weird, I know. But that's, that's how far we've kind of fallen in this identity game. Now, not, not you, but I'm saying you. Like Our culture is one in which we do that. You are the car. You are the clothes. You are. These are identity markers. You are what you accomplish. Your identity is based on what you do. Your identity is based on how important your work is, how burned out you get at trying to prove yourself. You are the tax bracket you fit into. You are your family's last name. Fill in the blank. There are endless possibilities of possible ways to be defined. But Onesimus, like all believers, he's gotten out of the rat race. You are in Christ, Onesimus. Look at the words from Paul here, verse 15. This is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a servant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. How much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Here, Paul is bringing this liberating news we all need to hear. Same to Onesimus. He stopped playing the game of, hey, you define me. Hey, you define me. You define me. Just this weekend, an article on ESPN came out. This is, I, I promise you, just one football analogy. But this one, this one is about Marcus Lattimore. For three years, the guy was a great ambassador for the University of South Carolina, a great football player, just a great person. And the ESPN article said, where did this guy go? He's out west working at a little tiny high school. He took on the role as personal mentor for this little tiny high school. And they said, what in the world? Why are you not... In the big time, why are you not doing something huge? And he said this, I had to get away because everywhere I went, I had to have a cape on. I had to be everybody's Superman. And I didn't know who I was if I didn't have a, a ball tucked in my arms and pressing everybody. It's an identity crisis. Who am I? Is that's what he's going through. But the, the good news for the believer is this. You don't have to be in that game. You're in Christ. 
Colossians 3, you've been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. You know what that phrase means? Hidden in Christ? It means God the Father unites you to his Son by his Spirit in such a way that he only sees the Son when he sees you. You are well-pleasing to him by faith in Christ. So what, the, what was said at the Jordan River, Behold my Son in whom I'm well-pleased, that is said to you if you are in Christ. You are fully pleasing to the Father through the work of the Son. And you don't have to play the game the world plays where you're like, I'm this person, I'm that person. You're in Christ. It's stable. It's staying there. A video recently had a, had a chicken walking across the road. No, it's not a joke. Uh, a chicken was literally crossing the road and a, suddenly a storm came upon them. Began to pour down wind and rain on the little chicks that were around the mama chicken. Immediately they ran to mom and she put out her, put out her wings and they got underneath her. And there the wind was battering and there all that other stuff was going. But that is a great picture of our identity in Christ. All the world playing that game of who are you? What have you accomplished? How great are you? Doesn't matter. We're in Christ. We're in Christ. Life can sometimes feel like a perpetual high school reunion. Always having to prove that you're not the loser. Always having to prove I've done amazing things. Look what I've done. While that chase goes on, a believer in Christ is so united to him that we're, we're actually immune. We're immune to the game. So here's, here's the main application. Dear Saint, believers in Christ live from their identity, not for an identity. We live from an identity of well-pleasing son. We don't, we don't live to earn that. It's already earned by Christ. Scripture draws a line right here. Humanity is in one of two camps. You have one of two captains, in Adam or in Christ. In Adam is the rat race, always having to work that flesh and prove I'm somebody. In Christ, safety, security, you're there. This is why Christ will say in the Gospels, my burden is light, come to me. As believers, we need this reminder, get deeper and deeper of your understanding of your in Christness, if I could use that phrase. You're well-pleasing to the Father through the Son. Number three, our new motivation. Notice how Paul appeals to Philemon. He doesn't say, you know what you ought to do. Go do it. Paul avoids the should. Verse 15, this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while. You might have him back forever, no longer as a servant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Let love motivate this action, Philemon. Do it because you love this man as a brother in the Lord. Here's the thing. Love and gratitude are far more potent motivators than duty. Duty will only get you so far. But love and gratitude are far, far greater motivators. N.T. Wright says, No Christian should grumble at the extra demands of love. These extra demands of love are but golden opportunities to draw on the reserves of divine love. And in doing so, you become yourself in Christ, more completely in the image of God, more authentically human. In other words, when you do acts of service, when you forgive someone, when you bless others out of a reservoir of love and not duty, you're actually reflecting the image of God because that's how your Heavenly Father does it. You want to act godlike? Most people hear that and they think dictators. Nope. Paul says, This guy has become a son to me in my imprisonment. His literal name is useful. That's what he's been to me. But I'm willing to part, I'm willing to part with him for your good and his good. And that's the heart of relationships. That's where Paul is going with this letter. Here's the big picture. Relationships are always about being others-centered. It's about being others-centered. He's already laid it out in the text this morning. Paul, I, I, I could pull the same card. Life is not fair, Philemon. I could say it's just totally not fair. Here I am in prison. He's though. It's not fair that I'm in prison. It's not fair that you've been robbed. It's not fair that you have to pay 500 denarii to make up for the loss. Okay, fine, not fair. But the Lord places us in relationships to give us these times of relational friction so that we'd pry our hands off the rights we think we have of our own life. 
God in his goodness and mercy places us right beside others so that we would become unglued from ourselves and more towards them. That's exactly why he does it. Others help us to see that. So as we wrap up our time here in this wonderful short letter, Philemon, a couple of things. We'll go back to the first point. You can only truly forgive someone to the degree you know yourself forgiven by Jesus Christ. Uh, to put it in counselor terms, I hate using this phrase, but forgiven people forgive. To the degree you know Jesus absorbed your sin and debt, you will then go out and do it for others. Number two, to the degree you know yourself as a new creation, your new identity in Christ, you will be able to see others rightly without playing the game the world plays, looking for outward markers. Who are you? Number three, to the degree you see yourself loved by God, to that degree, you will love freely. Loved people, love people. That will be your motivation. So just a quick break here from Revelation to discuss this wonderful short letter. Paul using his apostolic authority, not as a sword, but to say, hey, remember you're forgiven. I think you need to think about that with him. May we all take this in ourselves. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the patience you've shown to us. I pray, God, we would be able to show the same patience to others. God, I pray, Lord, all of us would have eyes to see the love you have for us. Lord, that we would understand ourselves to be in Christ, to, to leave the rat race that the, the world plays of what have you done recently? Who, um, what have you bought recently? None of that. God, that you'd free us more and more to see ourselves as in Christ, fully pleasing to you. Lord, may we leave this place and be a conduit of your grace, drawing others to yourself by the power of your Holy Spirit and your work in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, let us close our time in song. And this is 254, and it's 1 through 4, verses 1 through 4. 254, verses 1 through 4. Let's stand and thank God for His great mercy with For All the Saints, 254.
a pleasure and a joy to worship with you here this morning. Receive now the Lord's benediction. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thomas, it's weird. There's no... Nobody to run.